everyone. Welcome to another edition of Frazier and Dieter's Business Beat. I'm John Ray, alongside, as always, Roger Lesby. Hey, John. Good morning. Good morning. It's October 15th. Boy, you're smiling big. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's finally here. <laughs> yeah. The end of a tax season. I know. The, the end of it and the beginning of a new one will come soon enough, but we don't have to worry about that today, right? That's right. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, we've you brought a great guest today, right? Well, it's actually a, a client of my partner, Donna Beatty. Oh. Donna, welcome. Thank you. It's yeah. nice to be here. Yeah, Donna. So maybe uh, before we introduce... Uh, uh, Mark, Donna can tell everybody a little bit about you and what you do at Fraser and Dieter. Well, as Roger mentioned, I'm a tax partner in the Alpharetta office with Roger, and I've actually known Roger since the firm was first started. Um, so just super excited to be here. That's great. That's great. Well, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, and and uh, we want to introduce Mark Mearsman. Mark is with IPC Global. He's managing partner there. Mark, welcome. Thank you, John. Welcome. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here and to to give us the story on IPC Global. So tell us a little bit about your firm. Tell us what you do. Certainly. We are uh, a systems integrator. We do data analytics and cloud solutions uh, across a, a variety of industries. And uh, what we're finding now uh, with our clients is, is how much value can be gained by just exposing that data, putting it in where people can use it uh, to do their work. So there's a whole lot in that, right? Uh, let's unpack that a little more, and maybe you can talk about uh, the whole business of data or refined data, as you say, uh, you said off the air, being the new goal. I mean, we, we kind of know that intuitively, but maybe you can give us your take on that. No doubt. Uh, in today's uh, business, data seems to be everywhere. And so what we need to do is – collect it, process it, organize it, and publish it uh, to the various stakeholders. If you do that in a consistent, reliable way, it's, it's gold to them. And uh, what we find uh, the opposite of that is, is people just spend a lot of time buried in spreadsheets wrestling with the data um, and not necessarily coming out with consistent, reliable answers. And so what we often do is automate processes to deliver that. And so in these various industries are in, when we're in healthcare, could we deliver better care of quality you know, to our patients? When we're in uh, education, can we follow that student and, and more over their grade through a successful time to graduation? All of these things in these industries that we work in, uh, they know what their objectives are. We enable that with data and analytics. And publishing that, meaning physically putting it into the hands of those people that are making decisions and, and actions with those data. Uh, data and analytics, some people call it dashboarding, reporting, is not just for management and leadership. You can actually push that data down to the individuals uh, that actually are making a difference, to the nurses on the floor, to the people receiving you in the ED, to the teacher that's in front of you or the counselor that's trying to guide you. Data is really important for them, and it can really guide and in, in, uh, adjust the way they care or, or address whatever their role and responsibility is. So it strikes me that for big companies, collecting data is never a problem. It's really uh, warehousing that data such that you can easily access it in a way that you can get something out of it. Is that what I hear you saying? You got it. And so collecting data and this whole IoT stuff I see with the fancy watch on, right? This We've got data being generated all over the place. Sure. Even this digital data coming through this voice that we're speaking of can actually be parsed and analyzed in, in different ways. So um, the term you use, warehousing, is the generic general term for collecting and holding data. But uh, the problem with it, it, it was built out of traditional techniques, which actually aren't very good. People that do business that work, if you will, from Excel to solve a problem um, don't actually go into the data warehouse. You actually need an IT front end. And so one of the things that we've been able to do is refine gold data to the point where um, you can uh, give it directly to the people. It's a single source of truth they can access. So we call that a data store. I would be happy to send my colleagues or my customers into a data store to pick pieces of data off the shelf to do whatever they need to do to run their job. I would rarely send my colleagues or customers into a warehouse to go do something. And that physical image of warehousing versus store is different. 
when you go into a store, data is properly labeled. It's organized in sections that people can go find it and use it and begin doing whatever they need to do. One of the things we've been able to do is empower IT so that they can set up these storefronts so that their stakeholders in the various areas, whether finance, operations, sales, and marketing, you name it, these people can go get the data they need. In the old days, we needed business analysts who work for IT that really didn't understand the business to go into the warehouse, get the data, and bring it back to the business. In today's day and age, we're like, no, no, go shopping for your data. But it has to be prepared in a way that uh, stakeholders. So Donna here, uh, who's doing you know, various tax returns, is her data not only properly organized by client, by, but various categories and different industries that she in. So she can go in and get the data she needs uh, to do the work that she needs to perform. Um, and then report that uh, up to leadership so they can properly staff and organize resources to support her. And then speaking of industries, your big industries are healthcare, ed- education, and manufacturing? That's correct. Now, we do some media. It's been fun here in Atlanta. We've done Turner CNN, uh, Cox Media, and things of that nature, uh, and some professional services firms as well. But primarily, uh, our biggest industry would be healthcare and education. So. So was that planned, or did that just happen by? Well, uh, it just uh, the deciding to focus on a few markets was planned. Which markets was really, you know, through relationship. You know, um, I would argue until most recent years we didn't have full time marketing. Uh, it was really word of mouth, and word of mouth is you know people in industries. So um, it wasn't by happenstance here in Atlanta that, you know, over 10 years ago, um, I was friends with a, a guy that ran finance at Sibley Heart Center. This is a group that take care of our kids who have heart issues, right? Well, that gentleman uh, was friends with the CFO of that, and he became went over to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Children's Healthcare of Atlanta brought us to Wellstar. Wellstar brought us to Northeast Georgia. And these are it's a small community. These people know each other, and very much word of mouth allowed us to grow, at least in this local community uh, in there. Uh, one of the guys that came uh, to Children's Health Care Atlanta used to work for uh, SunTrust. Well, SunTrust said, hey, and so we came over there. And all these companies, if you do a good job and show up every day, and obviously experts in, in your domain, then they'll invite you back. And so we've grown these to be what I would call enterprise data and analytics customers. Uh, they operate at a much higher level than they did just a couple, three, five, ten years ago. Mark, I'm curious about, uh, you mentioned healthcare and education being uh, really your top two uh, verticals that you're after, Uh, and I'm about to make a broad generalization, but it strikes me that those two industries have uh, a whole, that you may have gotten into them because of relationship, but those two industries have a whole lot of data and a big problem in accessing that data relative to a lot of other industries we could talk about. Um, is that a fair statement or did I, did I throw everybody under the bus and I shouldn't have? Uh, I think everybody that's a medium to large organization is dealing with, with multiple systems. And so integrating multiple systems is obvious, is our sweet spot. Uh, but to your point, those are, you know, the most, um, uh, advanced, uh, or, or crazy amount of things that these folks have to deal with. And so we just happen to be very good at data integration. They have a, a, a I think you're pointing out, they actually have a, a problem to solve, and, and we've got a way to, to get there quite uh, expeditiously. So, yeah, you know, and uh, these this industry, these two industries have a lot of legacy systems. Maybe is the way to say it. Uh, you know, right? Particularly in healthcare, where you've got a lot of mergers, mm-hmm. right? And and you're trying to pull that data out. Uh, they've got a particular problem maybe that others don't have, seem to have. Mm-hmm. And they're on the move, meaning they are acquiring physician practices, sure. and that means data is merging, to to your point, and maybe even changing systems or multiple systems. Um, they all have a core backbone system. They call an EMR for uh, the electronic medical records, which are great. We leverage that. Sometimes they're coming from a legacy. Sometimes they have two or more of them. Uh, so to be able to bring that data into a single source of truth, you know what I think is funny uh, and it would be the pinnacle for all of us. When we walk into the doctor's office and they hand us a piece of paper and says, Mr. Mearsman, is this your history? Can you verify? I am exhausted, of course, in filling out that form <laughs> again, aren't we all? So um, imagine that. And that means they've integrated their data. They trust their data enough to give it back to the patient and say, can you verify who is your guardian or what is your age or whatever that is? You're filling that again. 
again and again. And so that would, that manifestation of that simply says they, as an organization, have a lot of confidence in their systems, even if they're dealing with, as you said, multiple systems. Um, the, the care history, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong diabetic. Um, if they knew that I, wow, this guy's got incredibly low blood pressure, but he's got an average A1C of X and these types of things, they could manage and monitor better. Every time I go in, they're asking me yet another question. So what we're trying to do is enable every provider, uh, that sees a patient to have a you know, consistent source of truth with regard to their, their patient. And, uh, that's just one example. This objective that I just stated needs to be the objective of the organization, in this case, the hospital, that that's what they want. So if they want to care for a child or help them through university or other things that we do, it's really their strategy. We get behind them. I think one unique aspect of what I just said, though, is people at the lowest level of the organization all the way up to the top CEO uh, need data. And I think it's often um, left only to the top leadership who need that. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, um, we, in our manufacturing examples, um, often, of course, will provide management information, warehouse, inventory levels, things of that nature. And so we create those dashboards uh, for their leadership. But um, data um, in the supply chain, we've done stuff for recall. So you know, one of our favorite customers that we have is the Warnick Company. They make the MREs for our military. So have you ever had mm -hmm. an MRE? You've eaten it from McAllen, Texas at the time and now uh, Blue Ash, Ohio. But nevertheless, um, one of the things they need to do is everything that goes into that pouch is tracked. Every pouch that's delivered to our military is tracked. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they had a mock recall. We have to recall every single product based on a single individual item that's in that, inside that pouch in a matter of hours. We need to know what base it's on. We need to know where it is and whatnot. And so that level of data and analytics actually is available to every person because every company that is collecting data you can actually do really advanced uh, things when you call into children's health care of atlanta we reverse engineered their cisco phone system so we know more about the caller and to make sure we can get the right language speaking professional on the phone to address that person's need um, and do analytics like that uh, my f most fun project it was a good number of years ago but um uh, at the Warner Company, they have uh, over 150 fork trucks on the floor at any one time. And these are traditionally uh, non-English speaking, non-high school educated individuals that are driving fork trucks around. They're very professional. They're awesome at it. Um, however, at the time, my kids um, had these uh, Game Boys. They were running around with Game Boys at the time, and I, they were started to compete with each other for score. And I said, well, wait a minute. What if we put a score on the fork truck for the fork truck drivers. Wouldn't that be fun for them? They could actually see. So we created a very simple data and analytics app that showed lifts per hour. So you, John, you have this many lifts per hour. Donna, you have this many lifts per hour. And all of a sudden now there's a game about it, and they could be seeing how they compare to everybody else in the, in the plan. It changed the whole dynamic. These people were now paying attention to their work, and it was fun because they were being compared to the next uh, colleague on there. It, in fact, helped uh, HR and staffing a lot because now people are actually taking less breaks. So interestingly enough, you can use data to move. Even at that level where you want to incent people, people can be using data to, to do their work better, faster, smarter. Now, there's some byproducts of that as well. One of the things that we wound up happening there is the guy said, well, I can move two pallets at a time. I'll <laughs> double stack them. And all of a sudden, now we started to have more damaged pallets. So what are we going to do? They're double stacking the pallets. They're damaging it. They're moving more. Sure. But they're whatnot. So quality in, uh, got involved and say, no, no, we, we can't be damaging the pallets even though you have this game going on. So what we found is if we could reduce the amount of damage on the products, it actually was a real dollar savings to the organization. So we provided incentive. We get through the end of the week with the minimum amount of damaged pallets. We could do something for the employees. So there's a lot of things that data can do at all different levels of management uh, in my example. And then I know another big issue, especially in healthcare, is going to be documenting quality of care. Is, is that an area then that you can help them with? For sure. Uh, in fact, uh, quality information is, is readily available. They're capturing it all the time. We've all heard of people uh, maybe slipping or hurting themselves in the hospital, unfortunately, at times for whatever reason, a secondary infection, or they get to um, discharge and there's a readmit. There's quality as it relates to the care. And I would argue 
clearly the, the care givers want to give the best, but we can gain some insights uh, into the, where that is. We can tell uh, in a given health system where secondary infections are going on that we can tell them what floor, what shift that's happening on. And so maybe we can retrain some of the providers, nurses or otherwise that are on the floor about washing their hands and getting some of the, the things that we bring into lives from under our fingernails. Guess that's where this stuff comes from. If you're given an IV and you got an infection under your fingernail, this is where this stuff comes from. And we can help uh, educate and identify and reinforce the best practices that the, all of our great caregivers uh, want to give. And that's true from the ED. When we discharge uh, an individual to their home, we actually know a lot about where they're going. And so would we prescribe a different way to care for them so they're, they're not readmitted and, moreover, they get healthy again? And um, and there's or situations that the hospital doesn't control what they when they discharge someone to the home, but they can help make sure that there's enough care over enough period of time that that individual gets healthy. And I think the whole system is is really designed to do that. But we need data to inform. Otherwise, everybody you know is average, and that's not true. Every, everybody's unique, actually. And so we can use data to solve that. To mm-hmm. Your question. Yeah, you know, some of your issues are fascinating. So thank you for sharing that, Mark. So another question, maybe a little aside, what kind of talent do you have to hire in order to help you and and help the company continue to grow? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, we use three words, uh, in our, to describe our colleagues, we call them, uh, experienced, engaging, and effective. Uh, so experience says they do have a, a domain expertise in the areas that I've spoken of, and we either train them or further develop them in their uh, experience using data and analytics to solve problems. Engaging is everybody is unique, and so that means you have to listen to what they are so that we can help solve that problem but also engage them with your experience because these colleagues of mine have been in just numerous situations and you can adapt and apply them. And effective, so a repeatable process, much like you all have in your various uh, roles in your in your firm at Fraser and Dieter, we have processes to uh, be very effective uh, at delivering this. We've you know been done that rodeo, I guess I, I should say. So each of the colleagues will interview and I guess I do that personally. I think I've interviewed most all, though not all uh, the colleagues at our firm. We're a little over 50 uh, colleagues strong. Um, that um, I take them to lunch, and I listen to how they engage with me. Uh, are they engaging or is it one-sided? How they even engage uh, the person that greets us and seats us to the waiter and whatnot. I think those attributes of, of someone are, are, um, need to be there to do what we do well. Um, and uh, and then we interview them on where they have worked and how they have seen work. My favorite question is, tell me about your mom and dad. Because if they witnessed and can explain what they did versus being, you know, playing Game Boy, if you will, and didn't pay attention to what their folks were doing, but you got to pay attention. And they watched what they did or what their bosses did or whoever uh, they looked up to, I should say. Um, that's really important. So I'd listen for things like that because as they describe – um, those people they looked up to. That's really important. Um, we use um, a few things in uh, uh, the motto of our firm. Uh, excuse me, the, the motto in our firm is customers for life. But the virtues of our firm, my favorite attribute related to your question is humility. That's our very first virtue. And it's not only humility being introspective. We all know that part of it. But actually, humility says you have the ability to listen. And in listening and engaging, back to that word, uh, is where then we learn. And then we can apply this experience that we talked about. Um, The other part of humility is is, um, also quite, um, uh, we look for, is their ability to look for and lift up others. Humility says you can draw the best out of others. What we do for a living is a team event. We partner with IT. We partner with the business. We bring resources to the table. It's a team game. And unless you can lift someone up, um, uh, then uh, you won't necessarily embody the characteristics of our firm, you know? You know, that's such a great answer, and thank you so much for that. And uh, humility, I think, is an important trait. I mean, Don, it's actually part of our interview uh, analysis is, is we ask whether the candidate uh, expresses the trait of humility. 
So uh, we're, we're right on board with you there. So thank you. You're welcome. And if I could lift uh, Donna up a little bit here. She was great. Um, uh, we came in. We had a dialogue. She asked the next question. She shared her experience. We ran around what maybe was an hour meeting, went into to multiple hours because it was a joy to share, but listen and learn come out of there with a, a statement of work and a plan. They helped us uh, uh, professionally and personally with our, our taxes this year um, and, and some challenges we were having over, over a couple years now, um, and that was great. And then from that, trust began to happen, right? And then I'm like, well, well how might I do this? And then I, I brought Don in on a, a challenge I was having and whatnot, and she then brought in another colleague of y'all's uh, that helped us out as well. And so um, that one relationship spurs, if you will, leveraging the power of your firm, um, uh, things like that. We hope to do that just the same. And I'll just add that um, as I listen, um, that's what I like to do is listen, because you can't help somebody unless you know what they need, as opposed to what you want them to need. No doubt. Yeah. For sure. So, Mark, you have your finger on the pulse of businesses. Where, where do you see the economy right now, and uh, what's your outlook there? So um, I think it's good. I, I think our uh, organizations, whether healthcare, education, um, and others, manufacturing, media, uh, I think they are healthy. And what healthy firms get to do is I, uh, many of them uh, would wisely reinvest and then how do they lift up their game? How do they make their game better? How do they even take a moment to innovate uh, around um, what they do? And so I think the, the overall health of the economy then allows us to actually have some you know, really uh, interesting and, and fun conversations to say, what if? And fortunately for us, our, maybe our differentiator in the market compared to others would be time to value. Because we are so fast at refining data, making it available, producing it in the information, it's okay that you fail. And that means people can, though we exceed a lot. I don't, uh, it's okay that you try something and it didn't come out with the uh, expected result. And that means um, we can invest and try, but when we get a hold of that thing that's driving the value and differentiator for our, our, our um, customers, then... Um, they get, the, they get the benefit of that, and it's repeatable, and it's reliable, and things of that nature. So. Very cool. Mark Mearsman, he's with IPC Global. He's managing partner there. Mark, I'm curious, for those that are listening uh, to, to what you're talking about in terms of bringing uh, data and analytics, cloud solutions all together, uh, how do I know I've got a problem you can solve? I mean, in terms of what do I need to, what, what are the characteristics, I guess, maybe better said, of firms that you work with that you uh, create success for uh, when they walk in the door? Yeah, I think there's uh, two, maybe multiple types, but two that I can speak of. Some are strategic. Some people says this is our strategic objective. How are we going to achieve that? How are we going to measure that? And we can't measure it after the game's over. We have to measure it while the game is going on. So what if we could publish by the hour, by the day, by the week, by the quarter, uh, that that information is being created to meet the strategic objectives of the organization? That's a great conversation to have. We're very good at, at putting that and then publishing those scoreboard, if you will, out to the stakeholders that drive that outcome. Some of it's more tactical where – gosh, I am just in a mess. I'm going to have to hire one or more people just to manually mash up this information to do what I want to do. And so those tactical things are very common. Uh, they just implemented a new system or we came live and it didn't provide this or I'm still trying to work to these uh, two or more systems. Um, so that tactical effort is, is very common as well. And so we will work with that stakeholder, whether it's in operations, sales and marketing, finance, HR, IT. We'll work with them on solving that problem. We collaborate quite well with IT to pull that off and, uh, we deliver it in a, in a way that it's reliable, sustainable, uh, and, and has a, a really good ROI. Right. So Mark, if you have a client that has this issue and they come to you, how quickly can you Give them a, an answer, a result they could use. Is it weeks, months, days? So it's it's weeks to months to answer your question. Uh, however, within um, the first two meetings, I would argue we have a plan, a roadmap. Everybody's looking for a roadmap. So we'll absolutely get a roadmap down and so that we have achievable things. This is a team effort. That means we're putting their <laughs> colleagues and my colleagues on the field uh, to achieve that. So we need a plan uh, to do that. Some of, And so um, – and then – 
next, we break the problem into what's uh, now known as agile uh, implementation. We break it down into sprints. Let's see what we can achieve in the next two to three weeks. Boom. And we release that value. So they're constantly getting value released to them every couple of weeks versus the old approach, big project, wait six or whatever months, and then we'll see what comes out at the end, which is also very good. I would argue um, the sprint-based approach allows us to deliver value. People are then in conversation throughout the implementation, um, and they're getting value. Sometimes we've actually written a roadmap and based on the first and then second sprint, they have adjusted the roadmap because they learn and they're like, whoa, I think I could get there faster if, but you needed to provide that communication and feedback for that to happen. So to answer your question, um, there's a very few things we can do in days except for planning, of course, but implementation is typically defined in, in week sprints, two to three week sprints. It strikes me, Mark, that you uh, have the capability of surprising and delighting. We're all looking to surprise and delight our clients. Uh, and you're probably bringing a lot of firms uh, capabilities that they didn't think were possible. I think so. I think um, that's part of the conversation is, is the art of the possible using sure. modern technologies. There are really known techniques that the Oracles, IBMs, and whatnot created back in the day using uh, traditional data warehousing technology. There's some amazing stuff out there now that will literally do all of that and some um, you know, within hours and, and days. And so we implement um, modern technologies, whether that's the in-process data factory that manufactures a single source of truth, Click BI does dashboarding, reporting, analytics, uh, data robot that does machine learning. It's incredible what a automated data scientist function could do. And I'll share a few examples with you if you like. Um, and then the cloud, which is just this versatile set of equipment that you can lease. Almost all of our customers are private clouds, meaning that's a, uh, it's theirs. No one else can get in it. It's quite secure, HIPAA compliant, PI uh, compliant environments that, um, that we use AWS for. And so those are our technologies of choice, though we use, gosh, uh, dozens of other technologies as well. Wow. So maybe you can talk about, well, you've mentioned a few. But uh, this is your forum to give is some to brag a little bit. So we're going to let you do that. Uh, talk about some success stories you're particularly proud of. Very good. So I'd shared one with you um, as it relates to uh, the Warnick Company. So I guess one that I'd like to maybe hear locally for all of our local listeners in Atlanta is um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Uh, I would argue our data and analytics solutions have touched every area from top to bottom and, and from left to right. And so um, one in particular that I'm, I'm fond of is um, the, um, this is a, a research project that was done is how long is a child under duress when we do a procedure? Okay. So we're going to go in, we're going to do a procedure and, and we're going to get out. And so one of the things uh, for your listeners that have preemies, one of the things they know is uh, in order to check the um, eye development of a child that the nerve bundle is, is happening um, uh, properly, they actually have to roll the eye back of this premature child. It's quite I imagine it's quite painful, and certainly the data, when they hook it up to the blood pressure, the white blood cell count, and other measurements of stress uh, for the child, uh, it would infer that that child is under duress for a while. And so if you asked a doc at the time, how many, um, how long is that child under duress? They would say, oh, it's just a few, I'm only in there for a few seconds. It's maybe 15 seconds an eye. Uh, well, that's not true. The, the white blood cell count, the, the blood pressure actually does not come back to normal for over 10 minutes. That means that child, and why is that? The child cannot speak. They have no idea if you're going to do something again to them. They have no way to understand. And so we use this data first off to inform the people that do this particular procedure and others. Um, we informed them on that this was happening. Well, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? And interestingly enough, they're like, well, what if we implement something simple as a Pavlovian type function? So if you all take your hand and you rub the, the little inter between your thumb and your index finger, that little spot there, what they'll do is they'll pick up the hand of the child immediately upon the end of the procedure and say, no, no, we're done. And they'll rub that spot because the child can't talk, right? They can't listen. They don't understand. And so now the child can say, oh, they're done. And then they, of course, are, are done. And the 
child now can then reduce by minutes and minutes that their system is not under duress. And then they're like, well, is this duress we've been putting the children under having a nerve impact to them when they're in their teens or even as adults, right? And so there's other studies going on about the impact that we have when we touch and more overdue procedures on, on children. That's fascinating. Wow. You ought to take that to the veterinarians as well. So interesting. This one is not necessarily my story. They have been uh, out uh, in various conferences speaking of this and, and among other uh, procedures that they do to say, can, we can do this better. And they want to do this better. They love our children and our families. So that's great. And then an operational example is this. Um, there's uh, a good number of surgery rooms down at um, Children's Health of Atlanta, and um, they were uh, considering adding yet another one. I said, well, let's take a look at the data on op- uh, scheduling effectiveness. Are we scheduling well? So uh, Carolyn, who runs that um, area, uh, worked with my colleagues, and they studied the data that said, and what if we could, again, on time starts? Did the surgery start on time? Was the patient and or a doc there, right? Did, was all the equipment there? Was it ready to go? Things of that nature that every procedure, how long does it take us to turn over a room between? Cause it's gotta be clean between procedures, right? What procedures run long? And what we found was docs would go in there and block schedule, meaning I want this much time, but it never takes that much time. It may have taken that time once or twice, but it never. So what we do is we were able to educate the scheduling professionals, the docs, um, and whatnot on this. And in fact, they were able to delay the addition of additional surgery room for over eight years because we optimized that. And so each of those rooms are a cost that you can imagine. So uh, simply using data to optimize scheduling. And that would be true for your firm. You've, you get busy seasons, right? And how do we optimize that? How do we watch for burnout uh, with regards to this? So one of the things we do is we watch for doctors. Which are the doctors who are getting their notes done at night? That means they're not doing it during the day. They've just worked a eight, 10 plus hour day and now they're doing their notes at night. Well, those are the docs that burn out. Those are the ones that check out. Those are the ones that do other things or leave. And so what if we could identify them and help them actually get that work done during the normal work hours and, and lessen the chance of burnout? So those are three in HR operational and, um, a quality example that, um, I would argue is, can be inferred into, into any business, you know? I'll take it over to uh, media for a minute because we're here, we're here on the radio, right? Sure. And um, what's fun about media is, you know, a lot of us um, would earn media revenue by placing ads, right? And so now we're going to place ads. What? When do we place ads? What are the best ads to place? And one of the things we've all seen on the radio is these uh, car dealers who are advertising for their car. Well, if we, and we did, integrate the weather data with the media and pricing data, it's actually more valuable, even if the price is higher, that they would advertise on a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday leading up to a weekend that's going to have a great weekend. And the price should be less when we're leading up to a weekend that's going to be raining because no one's going out to shop for a car. So what if we drove that incentive by bringing in data from multiple sources outside of the organization um, into the into the conversation? And we do that all the time. And those are the strategic things that people can refine data with, not just their own, but data that's complementary in order to drive uh, business value. I think I've changed total topics. Yeah, that's right. so sorry about well, that. We, we thank you. But uh, for our listeners out there, why don't you tell them how they can best get in touch with you, Mark? So I think, um, well, my name and number is right there on ipc-global.com. So I'm happy you would engage me directly. Um, and then we have offices, um, let's see, in Philadelphia, Dallas, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, we've got um, colleagues there in Boston as well. But a good concentration of us right here with you all in, in Atlanta. So. And a website address? Yeah, ipc-global.com. So all right, thank you. You got it. Great. Mark Mearsman, he's managing partner with IPC Global. Thanks for being with us. You got it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, this has been great. Folks, Frazier & Dieter is a thriving CPA tax practice, business advisory practice, employee benefit services, has an employee benefits plan services group, audit practice. But it, but in in all the expertise, the firm believes in relationships, and I think you heard that today. So if you want more information on Fraser Dieter, go to FraserDieter dot com. Roger, this has been great. I'm I'm learning a lot today. Yeah, I have too. Mark was a fantastic guest, so thank you very much. Yeah, this has been awesome. Well, 
until next time, let's do it again, right? All right. So for my uh, co-host, Roger Lesby, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on Frazier and Dieter's Business Beat.